Welcome to our roundtable discussion on the UK's energy transition. Today we'll be focusing on the move towards a hydrogen economy. I'm joined today by John Morrow, CEO of Scotia Gas Networks, David Surplus, OBE CEO of B9, Martin Bradley, Senior Managing Director and Partner at Macquarie Infrastructure and Real Assets, and Thomas Struder, Director in Macquarie Infrastructure and Real Assets. Um, my name is Terence Amico. I am the head of M&A at Centris. I will be moderating this, this event. Centris are a UK-based corporate finance business with a focus in utilities and the renewable space. David, to you, you spent a significant amount of time in the renewable space. Is green hydrogen a key component to enable us to meet the 2050 net zero targets? And can it be made more cost effectively for the consumer? Um, the amount of fossil fuels we're burning is uh, absolutely massive and if we're going to convert over towards green electricity as a replacement then we're going to have to store it and we're going to have to put it into the natural gas pipelines because the electricity network on its own wouldn't have sufficient capacity for transporting and storing all of that energy so if we don't do it we're going to have energy shortages in my opinion uh, to make it cost effective, uh, we've got to be using nighttime electricity off the grid that would otherwise be uh, uh, wasted from wind turbines. And then during the day, we have to use uh, solar power, which is correct, uh, connected directly to the electrolyzers. That's the only way we can get the demonstration of uh, green power and that the price points are low enough. Because of course, when there's too much generation at nighttime and everyone's in their bed, there isn't enough load, then the system operator in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland has to switch the wind turbines off. And that's a very wasteful process. So the, um, the system marginal price would be very low uh, on those occasions, down at 20 or 30 pounds a megawatt hour. And finally, if we can ask the system operator to waive the use of system charges at those moments because of the service we're providing to abate the uh, curtailment, then we can get electricity prices low enough for a cost-effective hydrogen production. The next thing would be to uh, make sure that the electrolyzers we use are the cheapest possible in terms of their through-life cost of ownership. And what we find through analysis of all the technologies out there in the world is that membrane-free electrolyzers offer the best uh, prospect of that. Uh, they don't suffer from uh, problems with membranes throughout their life, so they don't need replacements and modifications doing, and so it's much cheaper to own them. So that means then that we can run these electrolyzers only at times when there's too much wind or when it's sunny, uh, a duty factor of roughly 40%. So that's very low, uh, but we think we can do that. And of course, the levelized cost of hydrogen being produced from that is as low as you would find anywhere else in the world at the moment. So that's the production of the hydrogen. If we're then wanting to use it and distribute it, it can either go straight into the natural gas pipelines in the fullness of time, um, or um, you can compress it for vehicles. Now, compression is the same sort of price as making the hydrogen in the first place. So that's something we want to avoid. And we've done that by using the membrane-free electrolyzers technology which has cryogenic distillation as the method for separating the hydrogen and the oxygen and extending that into producing liquid hydrogen at, uh, at relatively low cost at small scale. And because once you've got the hydrogen in liquid form at minus 253 degrees Celsius, then it's much more energy dense it can be stored more cheaply at atmospheric pressures and it can be transported in higher density. So on a trailer, a tube trailer with compressed hydrogen, you might get a tonne or 1.2 tonnes of uh, compressed gas. 
with liquid uh, hydrogen, you would get about four tons of hydrogen on a load. So you can distribute it to refueling depots uh, more cost effectively at greater range. And then uh, you can use what's called a cryo pump to pump the liquid up to the 550 bar pressure that you're looking for and then vaporize it through a heat exchanger. And then you've got high pressure gas, but without the use of compression. And pumping is always much cheaper than compressing, especially with hydrogen with its very small molecular size. So in our view, that's what the future looks like. And, uh, you know, we're trying on a number of different fronts to bring this forward. No, no, David, that, that's a very full answer. And thank you very much for that. I'll move on to um, my next question. Um, and John, this is um, this is for you. Um, SGN are the forefront of developing hydrogen for domestic use. Um, can you talk about your recent investments in the space and how far away you get, are you to getting more than 20% of hydrogen going through your pipes? Um, so I think probably need to take a step back and just understand why a gas business or a gas network business is, is so interested in hydrogen um, and, 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 and why uh, we think hydrogen is uh, or should be uh, the main focus for heating. When, when you actually look at the demand curves in the UK for um, heat, you'll find that uh, about this time of year, uh, peak, peak heat demands are more than uh, four times the peak electricity demand. So you look at the electricity the curve, it's pretty flat actually nowadays uh, across the 12-month uh, period. You see massive spikes in, um, in, in heat load, obviously in the winter and also in today as well. So, um, you know, the challenge we've got as a country is to find a solution without the emissions that are produced from natural gas heating to meet that uh, very spiky demand. So um, we've got a couple of uh, really interesting um, investments uh, that, that we're making. Uh, we've got a project known as H100, uh, which is in Fife. It's a key national project to deliver the evidence base for the use of hydrogen heating in a real world uh, domestic setting. And the idea of H105 is going to demonstrate uh, hydrogen heat into uh, 300 homes in the area. Uh, and the idea is that we take um, green electricity from uh, a nearby offshore wind turbine. Um, it will go uh, directly into an electrolyzer uh, on shore. Uh, we're building some hydrogen storage on shore next to the electrolyzer. And then uh, there'll be uh, a network that uh, goes past a thousand homes. Uh, and we're doing an opt-in um, uh, project here. So uh, we'll be building a show home and that show home will have um, hydrogen boilers, hydrogen cooker, hydrogen fire. So the local customers in the area can come and have a look and feel what the actual future is going to be. Um, and, and experience zero carbon heat. So the idea is that we get 300 customers then um, uh, serviced with hydrogen uh, boilers and hydrogen cookers, and uh, we then run that trial for uh, a few years. The, uh, the, the next phase of that uh, is, is that we then extend the network and uh, go on to um, uh, actually go past another 3,000 houses. And, and that will be the start of uh, potentially then introducing 100% hydrogen into uh, our existing network. So it's a really exciting project. So, so that's really exciting. And we uh, think that uh, we will have uh, hydrogen heating in those houses within the next two years. Uh, we've got another project that we're investing in called Aberdeen Vision. Uh, this is looking at um, uh, clean hydrogen, uh, also called blue hydrogen, produced from natural gas with carbon capture and storage. So that uh, gas is coming in at uh, the St Fergus gas terminal, uh, in northern Scotland. And the intention there is to ultimately um, inject the hydrogen produced from uh, steam methane reformation plants up there into our Aberdeen gas network. And again, uh, that will be, first, number one will be to um, blend it into the local network and then eventually um, we, we go 100% hydrogen. 
the the other interesting thing about Aberdeen is that they've already got hydrogen uh, buses up there and an electrolyzer up there. And uh, again, that hydrogen produced from um, St. Fergus will be used to not not to just service heating, but also service um, transport as well. We're also working at uh, or on similar projects at the Isle of Grain. Uh, in Kent, actually doing some work with uh, National Grid and, and Cadent, actually. And also, uh, we've just started some feasibility work uh, at Southampton uh, to see how we can uh, use hydrogen to help decarbonize uh, heavy industry around that uh, um, that part of the world. In fact, one of our partners, I believe, is uh, Macquarie's uh, as well. So uh, the guys on the call may know about it. So let's talk about blending. So as I said, blending can reduce uh, emissions by or 20% blending can be can reduce emissions by 7% uh, and provide early demand for hydrogen, almost unlimitless demand. So, um, uh, you know, so, so we talked about supply, we talked about um, uh, production, uh, you know, putting put in gas or, or hydrogen into the gas network. Uh, is somewhere it can go and actually uh, significantly reduce our carbon emissions. Because what it would do is reduce carbon emissions from gas heating from about uh, 185 grams uh, of CO2 per kilowatt hour to uh, about 172 grams uh, of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So, so, you know, it's a transitional step, blending, um, and it's a good step to make because it, it kickstarts a hydrogen economy, um, but it is, it is only transition. So um, there's a couple of things that, that do need to happen. Uh, we are working with our colleagues across the industry trying to get some legislation changed so uh, to allow uh, blending of hydrogen into the network. So that's that's work that we're all doing with the HSC uh, and the UK government to progress that. Uh, I should also flag, though, that the whilst 20 percent blending is is good for domestic customers, there are we're working with industry um, because some industrial users do have burners on equipment that may be more sensitive. So uh, that that needs to be uh, addressed uh, as well. So talk about blending, talk about 20 percent, talk about H100 Fife. So, you know, after 20 percent blending, it really uh, for, for, for us to get to net zero, then you've got to go 100 percent hydrogen. So. I guess uh, that was a wrong, rather long answer to one of the questions that you asked me. Thank you, John. Martin, to you. Some of Myra's investments are at a portfolio level explore hydrogen. Can you tell us a little bit more about these projects and why they're interesting for private finance? First of all, Macquarie's been invested in, in the green economy for some time. OK, so we're, we're, we're quite big in 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 uh, all sorts of uh, renewable generation. We have about 12 gig at the minute on, onshore. We're, we're six, six gig offshore floating um, sites. Um, someone had given me a stat that said something like 50 percent of all wind farms offshore in the UK have Macquarie, uh, have Macquarie money in it. Um, and we've also acquired the, uh, the Green Investment Bank from the UK, so the our Green Investment Group, which now sort of is the centerpiece for, for our investment. And, and it's not going away. We're, we're only going to get bigger in that space. And for us, it's not just the UK. It's obviously, it's a, it's a global agenda. Um, we do have a good centre of gravity in the UK, so potentially a better perspective on it um, than we might have in other countries, albeit we run things like OG, which is the main German gas network, um, and it, it's the main transmission network. And obviously, it's also working under the German sort of um, mandate to sort of develop a, a hydrogen economy um, coming in from, from the North Sea. In the UK, um, our teams have rolled out 40% of, 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 of the smart meter sort of program and financed it. Um, and in Cadent, um, as John mentioned, we're working closely together. Um, we touch 50% of the households in the UK. Um, I was impressed with, with David's business model and, and the number of revenues that, that he can pull together. But at a scale level, if you were to invest in hydrogen today, you would starve. Okay, that's, that's just the sad truth. Um, now, I actually think the British, the government in the UK 
uh, and we've talked to them at length on this, has an amazing opportunity. The, the, the fact that they have the North Sea resources, both in terms of the gas out there for, for, for blue conversion and ex expertise, an existing infrastructure pipeline that, that can be harnessed or, or piggybacked to bring that onshore. And obviously, um, David was getting into the sort of the, 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 the economies of the offshore wind. And, and we do buy into a powered gas network. So we buy into a much bigger rollout of, of the renewable fleet. But the access capacity, the redundant capacity within that fleet also being diverted into um, conversion of, 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 of conversion of hydrogen so that that can be used as an energy store and, and sort of fit better into sort of um, consumption on, on the mainland. Also, lots of advantages in terms of bypassing blockages in the system. So we're, we're a big believer that there is one solution and, and we're invested across all the different economies. So we, 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 we're pretty agnostic on that. So our, our money generally flows into what we think is the optimized solution rather than being sort of captured, captured into one. So I think the UK is extremely well placed. I think there's great innovation. You heard a lot of it here today. Um, I think in many ways that innovation is putting the UK at the fore of this debate. However, I do feel, and, and I think Boris has got Boris has got absolutely sort of a, a good leader for this time in terms of what he's trying to achieve. But I do feel the financial political commitment on the mainland is stronger. Okay. So, um, so I'll come back off my statement that if you were to invest in hydrogen, you would start. Hydrogen will come, right? It, it will come. Um, it needs to be part of that solution. If, if we looked at trying to solve this over 100 years, we might come to different conclusions. If we're looking to try and solve it over 20 years, 30 years, then we do need the, the industries to work together. Now, I personally think, do you want to talk about the, 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 the thousands homes to the village, to the town, etc. I can see us phasing out, uh, through getting those, zonally coming out um, from a blend situation into a sort of more concentrated and, and then making the leap to 100% to hydrogen in a residential um, community. And I think government go ahead and, and support for that greater level of blending and that, that zonal approach will allow us to backfill the capital into the electrolysis and the equipment that we need to then prove out the, prove out the scale, the pilot. And then once we start doing that, the economies of scale start working in our favor. And I don't know if that covers, that covers your question entirely, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of how we come out. Good, thank you, Martin. Um, with that, I'll come to Thomas. So Thomas, we've heard about um, interest um, in various aspects of the hydrogen economy. Um, I guess one of the key things is about um, generating um, some sort of subsidy to help reduce costs on the supply side and also increasing demand um, from the end consumer. What can government do to aid that? Um, when a government sets a support for a new technology, let's say hydrogen in our case here, I think one thing that should be clear is that it tries to find a support scheme that forces the industry to continuously improve, so to become cheaper over time, um, but at the same time also um, in a way that limits the uh, cost to the government. Um, so with the cost curve over time, that's usually possible to come down in, in, in cost. Um, and people usually overestimate initially how much it's going to cost. Uh, they don't believe that um, hydrogen can become as cheap as it is likely to be. I think we already see the trends, and I think David pointed at it, that electrolyzers are becoming a lot cheaper. Um, the electricity input is becoming a lot cheaper with renewables becoming cheaper. So there's very good chances that hydrogen ultimately manages to get out of these subsidy schemes. And I think for any government setting a policy, that should be an important point. So start subsidizing initially, but make it a plan that ultimately allows the phasing out of the subsidy and the sector to become self-supporting. One of the really, really important things in all this is consistency and visibility. So any government policy has to be a long-term policy. This gives the investors the, um, the 
the, the confidence to invest in an asset that has a payback time that is decades. Um, we've seen this go wrong, for example, with renewables in Spain, where policies were changed after only a couple of years. And we've seen that it brings a, a sector to complete standstill in a country. So it must be in the government's interest to avoid that sort of error with hydrogen and instead have a policy that allows a smooth rollout um, that lets an industry grow and that doesn't cut it suddenly off because otherwise you've created short term jobs and then after a couple of years you suddenly lose them. Uh, you, you shock the investors to the point that even once you put a new policy in place to replace the old one, there's usually quite a lot of hesitance from the investors to come back in such a market. So consistency is very much key in setting a government policy. Now, in terms of whether you want to um, subsidize the supply side or the demand side, I think, again, there's um, there's different in, impacts of each of these. If you were to su uh, support only the supply side, let's say, um, it's difficult to see whether the demand side would actually grow along the, um, the supply that's being built. For example, if you think about hydrogen in cars, just because there's hydrogen available, that doesn't incentivize somebody to buy a hydrogen car. So most likely you would need to incentivize both sides of that equation if you want to get it into the mobility sector. Um, the heating sector that we've talked about is, is simpler. So if the hydrogen supply, a clean hydrogen supply was subsidized, that would mean that you could get relatively cheap hydrogen into a system. And if you can get that into the uh, into the gas network, you could very easily create the demand because physically the demand is already there. As John said, the customer doesn't really know the difference of whether they're burning natural gas or hydrogen as long as they have a compatible uh, burner or boiler. So. Um, that is a market that could start with only the, um, the supply subsidized. Um, if you were to go the other way and you only subsidize the demand side of things, uh, a problem that you would face is that you wouldn't have any control about the, the upstream part of the industry. So you could end up with um, having all the hydrogen imported, for example. And so you would pass up the opportunity to develop a local sector a local hydrogen production sector, all the associated industry jobs that come with building the infrastructure, and you would also have the disadvantages of the balance of payment that you would be um, importing the hydrogen, logically having your cash flow going abroad. Governments can, of course, also mandate, um, uh, mandate the uptake of hydrogen or the uptake of a green solution, and that can be another way of, of getting such a sector going. Um, probably the least popular is taxes, but taxes are of course a way in which governments can guide in which way a development uh, works. So the CO2 tax was already brought up by somebody. That's a, that's a great way of making sure that you're getting greener solutions. But again, it's a very agnostic solution. So you wouldn't necessarily get green hydrogen, for example, just because there's a CO2 tax, because it doesn't really disincentivize blue hydrogen or it doesn't disincentivize a heat pump. So you probably still need something apart to make sure that you get the, the hydrogen piece of it going. Um, does that answer the question? I think it does. I think it does indeed. Thank you very much for that. Um, where, where do you think the UK is vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, Europe in terms of developing a, a hydrogen strategy? This is almost a bit like commenting on who's ahead in a race before the starting gun, gun has sounded. Like everybody at present is sort of, of ready and strung up behind the starting line of ac something actually happening. And all the pilot projects and trials that we've seen so far, I would almost say those were training sessions for the actual race. So I think it's really early to comment on who's ahead. I mean, we've seen a lot of movement last year in terms of ambitions, in terms of the actual regulations and support schemes that will, will get the race going. I think we're all still waiting to see who's actually ahead in that. And I expect that we'll probably see quite a bit of movement in that this year. Um, 
we'll see whether the UK is is coming in before the European Union or vice versa. Um, I'm just happy for, for any of them to move or all of them to move at the same time. And then I think it will be the next five to possibly 10 years where we'll see who's really taking leadership in that space and not only taking it initially, but actually able to sustain that leadership. Yeah, look, Darren, I'll say a few things. I think Germany has a more defined national development plan. Okay, that's, that's the, the sort of, and a, a greater willingness and affordability to pay. You know, so in many ways, Germany, I think, has a better track record, stronger track record, if you will, and, and conviction, and, and therefore will be very impactful. Also, if I'm right, is about to take over EU leadership. Um, certainly deputizing at the minute and and there over this period will be will be the one watch as such holland has to move you know with everything that's happening in holland it also if i can use the phrase it sticks a straw in england's north sea um if we can call it england's north sea so holland holland economy is very driven towards being a solution provider in this in this space so i think they'll also also be quite interesting and then there's uk and i i am convinced that the current administration um has a personal agenda to 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 win here um and i think they could make some bold moves only look I, i'm not a big favor of subsidies um i think they generate the wrong behavior but you know if i take john's model of of phasing out um we have 20 something million households in the UK in a massive energy consumption. If you were to phase out to 10,000 homes and, and, and that would give you critical mass in terms of generation and, and investment in the electrolysis, really bring down the costs in the next next five years. If you were to, if you were to invest in those 10,000, 100,000 homes on a blended basis or even 100% hygiene basis, you make no difference to the socialized cost of the network in the UK. The energy network and yet you could move, move ahead with that really quickly on a mandated basis socialize the cost except that it's not going to be optimized and without putting in very complicated structures just limit the amount of um of the amount of um the scope of that project get it up and running drive the economies of skills and then once you're happy that you've 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 crossed over a, a, a few trigger points in terms of cost I think you could then roll it out quite quickly. Excellent. Thank you very much, Martin. So, Terry, I, Terence, I can um, uh, sort of uh, add to that, I guess. I mean, my experience with the different uh, jurisdictions in the UK, I, I would say Scotland, um, if I look at what Scotland have done, I think they, they have um, a really good understanding of what hydrogen is around. They got, so, uh, they got quite, quite good ambition. And, and I think that's a little bit of healthy competition. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they want to push hydrogen forward. I mean, I think Martin has said and others that, you know, actually hydrogen is a great energy vector, but it will be one of the many energy vectors that actually have to be put in place to actually decarbonize the UK's energy system. So, you know, if you want to spread bet, I think Scotland are looking at district heating, they're looking at hydrogen, they're looking at heat pumps. And to be fair, I think the UK government are, are looking at that a, 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 as well. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that does slightly concern me uh, is storage. Uh, I mean, no, notwithstanding wh wh whatever energy vector you go down, the UK does need, uh, in my opinion, uh, more energy storage. And I think you need strategic storage. I think you need interseasonal storage and uh, probably in today's storage as well, depending on which they go down. So, so I think, um, you know, there's a huge amount of work being done on various parts of the value chain. Storage is probably the area that uh, certainly when I'm speaking to various politicians, Scottish and uh, UK, that that's something that needs to be getting higher up the uh, list of um, things that needs to get sorted. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. That's appreciated. Um, David, did you want to uh, comment on that? Yes, well, certainly on the uh, mobility market, storage isn't quite such a daunting prospect because 
the consumption of the fuel is pretty constant all year round. But certainly with power to gas, as somebody mentioned earlier, you know, it's four or five times higher in winter than it is in the summer. And interseasonal storage, you know, you've really got to get into salt caverns um, or maybe liquid hydrogen storage below ground in shafts or uh, wells or well completions or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it is a challenge. Now, it, it's a challenge which we don't have to face immediately. So we can go ahead and get all the other pieces of equipment fully commercialized. And then we look forward to that large storage later on, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, is, is the sequence that things will take place in. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, Thomas, did you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I think one thing we also have to consider is hydrogen is tradable, right? So storage is one piece that you will need to a certain extent, but the extent to which you will need it will depend on how much you're also relying on imports and exports of hydrogen. And so it's quite well possible that we'll have a mix where um, we don't need to, to store a full season of hydrogen, but where we'll have a storage of, let's say, uh, a month, for example, and the rest could be balanced with imports from regions that at that time have surplus. So, for example, you know, take a southern hemisphere, sunny country, and deliver hydrogen from there in what is their summer and the UK winter. You deliver it to the UK in winter for uh, meeting that uh, that seasonal peak demand. John, David, Martin, Thomas, thank you very much for your time. Um, we're very grateful for your input and sharing your knowledge and expertise in the space. The hydrogen, we think the UK is at the start of its hydrogen, um, hydrogen journey with clearly a long way to go in terms of developing the infrastructure, but perhaps more importantly, in creating policy that encourages the transition away from fossil fuels towards hydrogen. There have been some good steps made um, with some subsidies being put in place and being talked about. Um, and I look forward to perhaps discussing this again in a year or two years time where we can clearly see um, the UK's footsteps towards that path. All, thank you very much. You, you've given some very, very full answers to my questions and I, and I thank you very much for your time.